If you have your outline, on there is a QR code. If you'd like to read along with the sermon, read along in the sermon or follow it along in the, uh, the full manuscript, that is available on the HIC Facebook page. The QR code will take you there. You just scroll down a little bit on your device and you can read along. Um, that can be helpful. <clears throat> The title of this sermon is Guarding Our Lives and Communities Against Corruption. How can we guard against corruption in our families, churches, workplaces, governments, and nations? This is important because as you remember, Scripture says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Sin starts out small in a family and as the children grow up, they practice it in their school And then they practice it in their business, their corporate places, the government practice it. And all of a sudden we have a government that cheats and is dishonest. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It saturates society as it starts off small. Therefore, we each have a role in stopping corruption and injustice in whatever spheres that God has called us to. Now as a student, one day as a parent, another day as a work in the education system. God has called each one of us to be salt and light. And whatever sphere we're in, we play a role in ceasing the spread or stopping the spread of corruption throughout the world. In 1 Kings 21, we see not only a corrupt government with Ahab and his wife um, calling the elders of the city to trump up charges against a man just to take his, his, uh, his vineyard. Um, but we see also these are the people of God. Ahab is the king of Israel. They're the ones that are called to be a light to spread throughout the world. So we see not only just corruption in the government, but we see specifically corruption amongst the people of God. The ones that are called to be a light to the Gentiles. And so as we look at this, from this narrative, we learn principles about guarding against corruption, again, in the various spheres in the church. Sadly, when corruption happens in the church, when a pastor is taking money or things like that happen... It pushes not only the world away, but it pushes Christians away. Many of you have seen this or experienced this um, and have friends that have turned away from God or doubt God's goodness because they've seen uh, dishonesty in the church. They've seen sexual morality in the church where there was no one to stand up to help stop the spread. It ended up affecting many. No doubt many nations around Israel were turned off by Israel's God because this was a God that was supposed to be holy, right? All the other gods, you had to practice sexual morality, sometimes bestiality and all types of immoral immoral things to worship them, to seek their favor. This was a God that called people to be holy. This was a God that called them to be justice. But when they were looking just like everybody else, in here they mentioned the Amorites, meaning the people in Canaan, then all of a sudden they say, why should we follow your God? You're just like us. You profess to be holy, but you don't even live holy. Certainly that happens around us all the time, happens in our societies when corruption spreads throughout the world. Well, we all have a role in stopping the spread of corruption. And so today we're going to look at six principles. I don't know if we'll get through all of them. It may be a two-part or I may just tell you to go read the last one on your own. We'll see how it goes. But here's the first principle we're going to look at. To guard against corruption... We must be careful of greed and covetousness. If you're taking notes, we must be careful of greed and covetousness. As mentioned, this sad story all begins when Ahab wants his neighbor's vineyard. Ahab Ahab had at least two castles. He had one in Samaria where he lived and one in Jezreel where his wife Jezebel lived. And so at this time, he's living in Jezebel, or he's visiting Jezebel in Jezreel, and he wants the field right outside the castle. It must have been a really nice field. It's kind of like beachfront property. If you've got a, if you've got a field right next to the, the castle, it's got to be a, um, a high-value field. So Ahab wants this field, and he approaches Naboth with a good offer. Give me your vineyard, and then I'll pay you silver, or I'll give you another vineyard if you'd like, but I want, I want the property right next to my castle. However, Naboth refuses. He says, the Lord forbid, in verse 3, the Lord forbid that I should show you my ancestral inheritance. Apparently, Naboth does not just simply reject this offer because, because it's a bad offer. It probably wasn't. It's probably a good offer. He rejects it because of his devotion to God. 
One of the things that we know about Israel and the land of Israel, the people of Israel and the land of Israel, in the Mosaic law, God taught Israel that God actually owned the land, that they were simply tenants of the land. They were overseeing it and that God owned it. God had distributed parts of the land to various tribes. If you were from the tribe of Dan, you had this part of land. If you were from the tribe of Judah, you had this part of the land. And they were to oversee it as under God. And because of that, they were not to sell their land permanently. Listen to what Leviticus 25, 23 through 24 says. This is actually in the New Living Translation. The land must never be sold on a permanent basis, for the land belongs to me. You are only foreigners and tenant farmers working for me. With every purchase of the land, you must grant the seller right to buy it back. Numbers 36.7 says this. In this way, the inheritance of the Israelites will not be transferred from tribe to tribe, but every one of the Israelites must retain the ancestral heritage. In fact, we know according to Leviticus 25, 25-28, the land could only be sold on extreme and extreme circumstances where One of the Jews was impoverished. They couldn't take care of themselves so they could sell the land to someone else. But they had to be able to have the right to buy it back. And if they were too poor to ever buy it back on the year of Jubilee, somebody have to correct me, I think that's like the 49th year, so seven times seventh, the seventh Sabbath year, they were to be given it back. If you had sold yourself as a slave on the year of Jubilee, you were supposed to be set free. Even if you couldn't give yourself, if you couldn't purchase for you to be set free. And so one of the things that we can tell about this man Naboth is that he was a man of God. He said, Lord forbid, I can't give you what God has given my ancestors. It wasn't simply in a time frame where, again, Naboth is ruling in the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and they were worshiping false gods, including Baal. This was one man that cared about what God said. This was one man that obeyed the scriptures. And so it wasn't just because it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a good deal. It was because he feared the Lord. If you remember previously, I think it's in 1 Kings 19 when, Je- when uh, Elijah runs for fear from Jezreel because the queen says, I'm going to kill you. So she, he runs and eventually he goes, to a, um, he goes to a cave. He meets with God and God, he tells, I'm the only one left, the only prophet left. And he says, no, you're not. I have preserved 7,000 who will not bow to Baal. There are 7,000 righteous ones in the northern kingdom that will not bow to Baal. This obviously, Naboth, was one of them. He was not going to, he knew that doing, saying no to the king could get himself in trouble. Scripture says this was the worst king of Israel. They were hunting and killing prophets. He was willing to stand up and say no. He says the Lord forbid. So we know this about Naboth. Apparently he was a righteous man that obeyed God. But what I want you to see from this is that what must stand out is that Naboth's eventual death and uh, happened because of Ahab's greed and covetousness. Ahab had owned the kingdom. He had two castles and yet he wants one extra piece of land. This leads to Naboth and apparently his family dying uh, in, in 2 Kings 9, 26, I believe it is. It actually talks about how Jehu eventually who wipes out Naboth says, talks about Naboth, uh, the blood of of Naboth and his sons. In order for Ahab to take the field, not only had to get rid of Naboth, which which his chapter tells us about, but apparently he also wiped out those who would have inherited it. And so he wipes out all of them because of his greed. He was greedy and he wanted more. And eventually this leads to Ahab's family dying as well. Often the beginning of corruption in our societies often begins with greed as well. It begins with little little things like this. With children at a young age, parents, listen to this, when they're not taught to tame their desires. They don't have to have every toy that they want, every piece of candy. They don't have to be able to watch every TV show they want or stay up late at night. Untamed desires, including coveting, can lead to breaking every one of God's commands. Future parents, be aware of this. We blaspheme God because we didn't get what we want. We didn't get the grade we wanted. We didn't get the girl we wanted, the relationship we wanted. And we say, oh God, how could you do this? Or why would you allow this to happen? When we don't get what we want, it can lead to breaking every one of God's commands. We lie 
to get what we want. We didn't get the grade we want, so we cheat to get what we want. We steal. Maybe we'll even be willing to murder as Ahab does. Greed often is the very beginning uh, that leads us, leads to corruption in a family, in a church setting where, where people steal money or do different things, in a government setting. Greed, as we see here happening in Israel's government, often leads to all types of corruption. In Luke 12, 15, Christ warned of the dangers of greed. He said this, watch out and guard yourself because you're vulnerable just like I am. Guard yourself from all types of greed because one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. Likewise, in 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10, Paul said this, those who long to be rich, if you're a person who longs to be rich, you need to listen to this. Those who long to be rich stumble into temptation and a trap and many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Some people in reaching for it have strayed from the faith, they've left God and stabbed themselves with many pains. Longing for, wealth, longing for wealth leads to destroying people's integrity, health, family, and even faith. Proverbs 27, 20 says this, As death and destruction are never satisfied, so the eye of a person is never satisfied as well. Because our eyes are never satisfied, we must learn the discipline of contentment and teach our children or those we mentor the same. We talked about this last week. In order to, uh, to protect ourselves from the common consequences of covetousness and greed. Paul said this in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. This obviously protected Paul from becoming like a lot of the religious teachers that became wealthy off their teaching of religion. We know that when he came to Corinth, he chose not to take any money from them at well. Now their tithes or offerings went to him. And part of it seems to be that he didn't want to be associated with these, these teachers who would take great wealth from them. He says this in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. We studied this last week. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content in any circumstance. I've experienced times of need and abundance in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of contentment. Whether I go satisfied or hungry, have plenty or nothing, I'm able to do all things through the one who strengthens me. Paul could be content in whatever state of life he was in, sickness, health, etc., because he realized that he could be strengthened through Christ. Again, likewise, 1 Timothy 6, 6-8, godliness combined with contentment brings great profit. You want wealth? Learn contentment. If we brought nothing into this world and so we can take nothing out, if we have food and shelter, the literal word right there, shelter, is covering, probably referring to clothes and housing, if we have food and housing and, and uh, clothes, we will be satisfied with that. Remember again, the context of this. If Ahab didn't want this field, it would have, it would have protected Naboth and his family from death. But it also, as we see later on, would have protected Ahab from death and his sons from death. All of this happened because of greed. David you know the story of David. If David had not longed uncontrollable from what for his, from his, for his best friend's wife, one of his mighty men, um, one of his mighty men, Uriah, if he hadn't longed uncontrollably for Bathsheba, it would have kept him from losing his firstborn son. That's part of the consequence of his sin. It would have kept him from having his daughter raped later on in his life. His son killed his brother. And eventually that same son tried to usurp him as king and tried to kill David. All of these consequences came from untamed desires. A greed, another type of greed. Christ said, uh, beware of all types of greed. Lust is a type of greed. Not being content with your wife or your spouse or being single. In the season of singleness, God has given you this untamed desire that we don't get under control, whether it be lust or desire for money reaps all types of consequences, as it did with Ahab and David. Um, even even the, the, the fall ultimately comes, why? Because of greed, right? I'm going to give you, uh, Adam and Eve, I'm going to give you everything. As far as you can see, this whole world, it's yours, except for this. And even though they had all the trees and the gardens and the mountains and all that there was, the one thing they didn't have, they wanted. She wanted and it led the world into sin. Corruption came from greed. And it happens all the time with you as well. It starts small, 
with untamed desires of lust that you can't get control of on the internet. Untamed desires. You've got to have every new flashy thing. Untamed desires. You want this and you want that. And so all of a sudden you start to cheat and do things that are dishonest to get it. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It grows in your life. If you don't learn, you don't learn how to be holy and, and, and control your desires in singleness, then you won't be able to control them in marriage, right? Scripture says if you're unfaithful with little, little may be your singleness, you won't be faithful in marriage, which is much. If you're unfaithful in little, that means taking a test and, being, and being, having integrity in school, then what happens when you get into a corporation? And you're overseeing millions, if not billions of dollars. What happens then? If you're unfaithful with little, if you're unfaithful with little, uh, then you'll all be unfaithful with much. Corruption often starts off small with being willing to just tell little white lies or to download illegal things. If you're unfaithful with little, you'll be unfaithful with much. Corruption starts off small. It leads and it eventually affects you and affects others as it did with Nahab, as it did with Ahab, David, and also we see with just at our fathers and our father and mother, Adam and Eve. How can we learn contentment? To learn contentment, we must learn the difference between a need and a want. My daughter would be like, I need it. I'm like, no, 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 no. You want it. <laughs> you want it. When I take my daughter shopping, we'll go to the base. As you know, I'm a Navy Reserve chaplain. Go to the base and every aisle, can I have this? Can I have this? No, no, no. Like, it's not a need. It's a want. One of the things you've got to learn the difference between, is between a need and a want. God, God promises to meet all your needs according to his riches and glory, especially as you seek first the kingdom of heaven. But he doesn't pr uh, promise to give you every want and desire. As we discern the difference, we often have to learn to be content with what we have, what we, the needs that we have. We have to learn contentment, otherwise you'll always want more. Again, Proverbs 27, 20 says, our eyes are never satisfied. It's like an empty stomach. Your eyes are never satisfied. You have to train yourself to be content with what you already have. You're, you have to learn the difference between the need and the want. Second thing, to learn contentment, you've got to learn to practice generosity. You have to learn to practice generosity. By practicing the discipline of giving, you start to learn what Christ taught in Acts 20, 35, that it truly is more blessed to give than receive. Most people have never learned that. And so therefore, they're just simply clinging and grabbing and getting more and more and finding themselves, they get something, they call it buyer's remorse, you buy it, and all of a sudden you say, well, this didn't make me happy. And I get this, and this really didn't make me happy. And I get that, I'm not really that happy. And so you just keep doing, never learning from the fact that you getting doesn't make you happy. But blessed can literally be tra translated happy. There's a happiness when you give. There's a happiness when you meet other people's needs. That's how God is. He so loved the world, he gave. And so one of the disciplines you must learn to practice, if you're ever going to learn contentment instead of this buyer's remorse, instead of getting and getting and getting, and you're still unsatisfied, you learn how to be generous and give to others. And as you give to others, Scripture says, Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will people pour into your lap for the measure you use will be measured back to you. But also to learn contentment, we must learn the discipline of practicing thanksgiving, which is a discipline we often don't do. The discipline of thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in every circumstance for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Because you're in Christ, because you've been saved and born again and you have a relationship with God, you have to learn how to give thanks as a discipline in every situation. Whether well fed or you don't have enough. Whether you eat a lot or you do eat a lot. Whether you have needs or you don't have needs. Right? Learning how to God, I give you thanks. The Lord gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was a rich man. But even when he lost, ever he lost his wealth, he was still content. Partly was because he learned the discipline of thanksgiving a long time ago, which helped him be, have a measure of contentment when he lost. You have to learn that discipline as well. I have to learn it as well. To learn contentment, we must develop a flourishing relationship with God. A flourishing relationship with God. Again, Paul said the secret to contentment was, I can do all things through him which strengthens me. 
If you have a non-flourishing relationship with God, meaning you neglect the word of God, you neglect prayer. Maybe you're at church this Sunday, but maybe you're not at church. You pray some days, but some days you only give them a couple of minutes of prayer. If you have a non-flourishing relationship with God, you will struggle with contentment. We all do. But by abiding in Christ, by finding your strength in Him, you will learn the secret of contentment. Hebrews 13, 5, the writer of Hebrews said this, Your conduct must be free from the love of money, and you must be content with what you have. Why? For He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The writer of Hebrews says the secret is God. You can be, you can live content without having a need for, all, a love for money and things if you learn that he's with you and he's enough. And he's the one that ultimately brings satisfaction. Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For what? They shall be satisfied. In righteousness, in Christ, in knowing him, in caring for others, you will find a satisfaction that you'll never get by grasping after things. By getting the newest video game or the nicest clothes or new shoes. There's a contentment that you get when you truly hunger for righteousness. It satisfies you. Ahab's greed and covetousness led to government corruption. It led to losing his life. His, his sons lost their life. Naboth and his sons lost their life. And it all became, came because sometimes, I mean, you read the narrative, it sounds like a little child. If you, some of you have never raised little kids, but it's amazing. I got a one and a half year old. And it's like, it's like, it's there. If he doesn't get his way, he drops on the floor. That's what my, that's what my daughter did. That's what the other daughter did. Is there something about dropping to the floor when you don't get your way? Right? Just pouted. He doesn't, get the, he doesn't get the field and he starts pouting like a kid. You can learn, just look if you have, again, just thinking about what, how was he raised. This is something he's been doing since he was a baby. <laughs> Some parent never trained him because he was, a, he was a king's kid, right? Some parent never trained him to tame his desires. And so he's like that all the way throughout his life. Like, oh, and he just pouts like a little kid, right? That happens all the time, right? Oh, I, my girlfriend broke up with me. I don't even want to live anymore. Are you serious? It's not over yet. I counsel a lot of people like that. Not so much at Handong, but in the military, it happens all the time. It's like, look, it's not over. Trust me, it's not over. It happens to all of us, right? When you've never been trained to tame your desires, um, that is this, that's how corruption begins to spread in our lives, but also in governments, in churches, in education systems. Here's an application question for you to wrestle with, and those of you that go to Connect Group, you'll discuss this. Why is it so difficult to be content? both with what we have and in our circumstances in general? In what ways are you vulnerable to discontentment, greed, or covetousness, wanting what you don't have? How is God calling you to grow in contentment and get rid of covetousness? Here's the second one. To guard against corruption, we must be careful of ungodly relationships. We must be careful of ungodly relationships. As mentioned, when Naboth denied Ahab, he went home, began to pout, even choosing, I'm just not going to eat like someone's going to fix it for him. I'm just not going to eat anything because I lost, I didn't get this, this, uh, this, this, this vegetable field, this vineyard. When his wife notices, she says, why do you have a bitter attitude? This is verse 5. He then explains the situation in response. Jezebel rebukes him. You are the king of Israel. Get up, eat some food, have a good time. I'll get the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, for you. She essentially says, you can't let a Jezreelite deny you. See, one of the things we know about Jezebel is that she was the daughter of a king. She was the daughter of the king of Saddam. And then 1 Kings 16.31 describes that. And in that culture, as many cultures in the ancient world, if you were a king, you had absolute power. You're a dictator. And absolute power in that kingdom. And so these kings rule with an iron fist. So she looks at Ahab and she can't even comprehend. You're crying and whining because our neighbor says you can't have his field. You're the king. Do something about it. Jewish kings were not known for that same type of ruthless way of ruling because they saw themselves ruling under God. They were accountable. It was God's land. And they were in authority only because God allowed it. So they didn't rule in the same way other kings did. And so Jezebel takes things into her hands. She wrote letters to the elders of the nobles of Jezreel to falsely accuse Naboth and have him put to death. 
she used Ahab's seal, which implies Ahab was complicit, saying this is coming from the king. Ahab was complicit in her evil plan. Now, as you look at this narrative and you remember what happens before it, this is not the first time that Jezebel has led Ahab into worse sin, influenced him to do evil. In fact, 1 Kings 16.31 says this about Ahab. As if following in the sinful footsteps of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, were not bad enough, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal of the Sidonians. Then it said, then, meaning this led to then, he worshipped and bowed to Baal. Baal worship came from Jezebel. Ahab became a worshiper of Baal because of his wife who influenced him to make this the, the major deity of Israel's kingdom instead of Yahweh. Then he worshiped the Baal. She was, in fact we know in other, in other times, um, Jezebel was essentially the power behind the throne. She was the one in 1 Kings 18 that was hunting and killing all the Yahweh prophets. They were hiding in, hiding, in, hiding in caves because Jezebel wanted them dead. She was the one who threatened to take Elijah's life after Elijah in this confrontation in chapter 18 where all the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah are killed. He has them killed. Jezebel is the one that decides that she's going to kill, A kill Ahab. Excuse me, kill Elijah. Not her husband. Kill Elijah. Now, if you remember that narrative, in chapter 18, Ahab is actually submitting to Elijah. Elijah says, Elijah says this, he goes, hey, rain's about to come, Ahab, go and eat and drink because rain's about to come. And then when the rain comes, he says, Ahab, go ahead and go to Jezreel before the rain sweeps you over. And Ahab listens to him. And then when he gets there, all of a sudden, the queen says, no, I'm going to get this dude. This dude's going to be, this dude's going to die. She threatens to kill Ahab and hardens his heart. Certainly this commonly happens today as well. Not only in marriages, but in any types of relationships in general. Listen to this. Especially as you consider someone to marry or date. It's always easier to pull someone down than to pull somebody up. If you imagine me getting up and standing here and I had someone, a volunteer from the front, and I tried to pull them up here or they tried to pull me down, which one would be easier? Pulling me down would be easier. It's always easier to pull someone down than it is to pull somebody up. That's what commonly happens in our relationships. For this reason, Scripture strongly urges us to stay away from relationships that would urge us towards spiritual apathy, uh, sin, idolatry, or anything else. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said this, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals or corrupts good habits, some versions say. In the context... These Christians had false teachers in their church. In 1 Corinthians 15, um, in the context when he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, don't you know that if there's no resurrection, your faith is in vain, that our faith, there's no point to worshiping God if there's no resurrection. These false teachers were saying that either Christ never raised from the dead or they were arguing that there was some type of spiritual resurrection. And that we would not be physically resurrected. That's why Paul goes in and talks about the rapture later on. That our bodies would be transformed into these glorious bodies. They were saying there would be some type of spiritual resurrection. There are denominations that teach this today. Be aware of that. He says, don't you know that if you hang around false teachers, you're going to end up believing false things. And what you believe affects how you live and you walk. Bad company corrupts good morals, good habits. So he tells them basically to stay away from these false teachers in this congregation. In 2 Corinthians, when he writes another letter, obviously they were not obeying him, when he, what he said in 1 Corinthians 15. So he writes another letter in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. These false teachers were actually challenging, saying Paul's not even a real apostle. Why are you following him? So he has to argue for his apostleship in the second letter. And 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18 in the ESV, it says this. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He has to warn them again. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Right? And so he calls them to not be unequally yoked. Now, what does that mean? 
Unequally yoked is a farming metaphor. Two bulls will be yoked behind the neck to pull a cart. However, if the bulls were not yoked equally, meaning this, they had different temperaments. One bull was very rambunctious, very, and one bull had a very uh, slow, uh, very uh, calm temperament, different strengths. Then one bull might actually harm the other bull, or they'd pull in different directions. And consequently, their work could not be effective. Likewise, Paul says that yoking relationships with those who live worldly lives, whether in marriage, close relationships, or work relationships, can be hazardous. They can corrupt your morals. Again, it's always easier to pull someone in a sinful direction than it is to pull them in a righteous one. Also, he says this right after this, being unequally yoked will hinder one's relationship and experience of God. Consider the promise in the next verses we read before, 14 through 18. Um, Listen specifically for 17 through 18. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, this may sound strange. How can he be a father to them? They're Christians. Right? He's writing to a church. He's talking about the experience of a father. The experience of intimacy with God. When you are compromising with the world, that can be not just in a physical relationship. It can be through the music you listen to. It can be through the TV shows that you engulf that teach ungodly things and sexual morality. All of a sudden, there are many Christians that they read the word of God and they get nothing from it. They listen to a sermon and said, man, Pastor Greg had nothing really to say today. Which may be true. But it also, if the seed is the same and one person receives and another doesn't, then what's the difference? It's the heart it goes upon. There are many people that experience lack of intimacy in their prayer life, lack of intimacy in their relationship with God. Why? Because they're yoking with the world in various types of ways. And therefore, they have a dryness in their spiritual life, dryness in their corporate worship. They're yoked with the world and it's hindering their relationship with God. It's influencing them negatively. James 4.4 says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. God says you have to choose. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Are you following me or are you following them? Who are you following? With all that said, I'll add this in there. There is a clear line between, um, and maybe it's not as clear, but there's a line between being unequally yoked with the world and yet what Christ was called, he was called a friend of sinners, right? Matthew 11, 19. He was a friend with sinners. What's the difference between being unequally yoked with the world and yet Christ ate with the sinners. He drank with the sinners. Matthew's friends, they had a banquet. All the Pharisees were like, they they mocked him because he, he hung out with the ungodly. Now what is the difference? Christ could be a friend with sinners because his relationship was an influencing relationship versus uh, meaning he's influencing them towards godliness, influencing them to follow him versus a being influenced, he being, him being influenced instead. It was genuine. His relationship with unbelievers was genuine, genuine, but it was not as intimate as he would have desired because they had not repented of their sins to follow, follow him. We must be salt and light in the world and therefore be around unbelievers, but we must be very careful of reducing our saltiness and redeeming our light by the language, by changing our language, by changing the way, our, our, the way that we dress in a way that's modest. We must be very different from reducing our saltiness um, when we're starting to be influenced instead of influencing them. Ahab was yoked with the world through a marriage to Jezebel, and it led him to be the worst king in Israel's history. He was incited and further sinned by his wife. We see the same thing happen with Solomon as he marries all these pagan women and it draws him away from God. He starts to worship all the different gods just like Ahab did. Solomon, a godly man with a godly father who had a genuine relationship with God, fell into the same trap of Ahab. Why? Because he thought, oh, these are just relationships. And in those days, you may not, it's not the same. When you think of marriage in those days, Ahab and Jezebel, they lived apart. Two different castles. They had... Kings had harems for physical intimacy and for love. Wives for, were for influence to have a partnership with Egypt or a partnership with Sudan. It wasn't, oh, these, this is just marriage. I read one uh, narrative, can't remember who it is. Some ancient, ancient guy says, 
Is there anybody that we speak less to than our wives or have any less relationships? That's how it was in this ancient context, right? When Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, husbands, love your wives, we think, oh, yeah, that makes sense. No, 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 that didn't make sense in that ancient context. When you're studying the Bible, you have to read it in context. This was, this was, uh, this was countercultural for them. Husbands, love your wives. Remember, in their culture, they would go to the temple to have immorality with lots of women and males as well. Like it was a, a sexual culture. Uh, having concubines, we go in the book of Judges, we see a priest. Was he a priest? A Levite who had a concubine, an unofficial, I mean, a, like an unofficial wife, like a girlfriend where he had his relationships. He wasn't married yet. That was normal when the Israelites started to become like the nations around them. They were just like them. Like, like so... I forgot where I was going. Oh, so Ahab probably thought nothing, Solomon probably thought nothing about these relationships. They're just wives. It's not like I love them or anything, right? Um, but yet they all influenced him towards becoming worldly. Nahab, Ahab became party to the death of Naboth and ultimately it led to the death of his sons. Listen, if you're going to guard against corruption in your own lives, you've got to be careful of ungodly relationships or ungodly partnerships Instead, our closest relationships with what should be with those who are zealously following the Lord. Where do I see this? Look at 2 Timothy 2.22. 2 Timothy 2.22. Paul, in counseling Timothy, who could have fallen into the same sin as Solomon, he says this. But keep away from youthful passions. Pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, peace. With who? In the company with others who call the Lord from a pure heart. Get around people who are zealous for God. As iron sharpens iron. You need to get around people who are serious with God. When we consider Christ and his relationships, he, yes, he was a friend of sinners. But it's often been said that there were several rings of intimacy around Christ's relationships. First of all, his closest relationships were with who? The three. The three he took to the Mount of Transfiguration. The three he took to pray before he died. Peter, James, and John. Those are the leaders of the apostles, right? The ones who were most Serious for God, if you, would say, if you want to call it that. Those were his most intimate relationships. Then what's the next ring? Then the rest of the 12. Then what's next? Then he had the 72 that he sent out to do miracles. What's next? The rest of the believers. And then what's next? Then the friend of sinners. In the same way, we should get around people who are zealously following the Lord out of a pure heart. Not, oh, I follow God, but I, I'm also living for the world. Right? That's not a pure heart. Those who are really after God, and that will help you grow in your evangelism. It will help you grow in love for the Word of God. It will help you grow in holiness. Proverbs 13, 20 says, The one who associates with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. In the Proverbs, wisdom is not intellectual. They got an A on their test. That's not what wisdom was for the Jew. Proverbs 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so when Solomon is saying, he who walks with the wise, who's he talking about? The wise are those who God is first in their life. Following him is the most important thing in their life. Being obedient to him and pleasing to him in their thought life, in their actions. Follow, uh, in the, follow after righteousness and love and faith and peace with those who follow the Lord out of a pure heart. And when you walk with the wise, you start to look like them. But the friend of Fools, meaning those who reject God, who do not obey God, will suffer harm as Ahab did, as Solomon did because of his relationships. To guard against corruption, you've got to be careful of your relationships. We're only going to finish three of these today, so it is going to be a two-part sermon. Here's the last one. To guard against corruption, we must have righteous leaders. We must have righteous leaders. Now what has to stand out when you read this narrative and the corruption happening is it's with the king, it's with the queen. Then she sends letters to the nobles, the elders of Jezreel. The people who are meant to, Romans 13 says that God puts people in leadership. There's no authority but that which is of God. And he talks about how the authority is meant to reward the righteous and punish the wrongdoers. Right? And so here in Israel and in Jezreel, the leadership were the ones who were doing what was wrong. Um, this reminds us of the importance of having godly character in the, those who lead. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul gives the characteristics of the leaders of the church, deacons and elders. 
And if you read through those characteristics, all of those characteristics, with the exception of one, being apt to teach the, the main skill set of a leader, elder in the church specifically, all of the other, other ones were character traits. They should not be a brawler. Literally, it means someone who's given to blows. Meaning, they can't be someone who wants to get in fights all the time and argues all the time. Because if you have someone like that who's contentious in leadership, you'll split the church. Right? They have to be hospitable if they're going to serve in leadership in the church. Literally means a lover of strangers. Strangers. The church should be inviting the world into the church. And so people in leadership, deacons and elders, must be those who love strangers. People of different ethnicities, different from different ba backgrounds. They must love strangers because God loves strangers. They must run their household well. If they're married, they must be good husbands and good leaders of their children. They're all character traits. When God looks for someone to use greatly for his kingdom, he finds someone who has great character. Character is more important than their skill set. He finds someone with character and then he equips them to, to do all the other things. He trains and equips them for great service. Unfortunately, in the world, education is more important than character. Where would you graduate from? What's your degree? Skills, experience, beauty, contacts. You're, who do you know? And other qualifications. And for that reason, we commonly get people in leadership that lack character. You'll work in companies someday and it'll be hard to follow. I remember I worked in one company. I worked for Kraft Foods for a short time. Top, a Fortune 100 company in the U.S. And they had a gym. I was a personal trainer at the gym. And my, my boss would tell us, he'd be like, he'd like look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm taking off, but I'm not taking a day off. Right? And so he'd tell us, he's like, look, so if they call, just tell, us, tell them that I'm not here. Right? So that he wouldn't lose days off. And I said, look, I'll tell them you're not here because you're not here. But I'm not doing anything further than that. Right? And so you'll often find yourself working in companies where there's just corruption. Because that character is not the main quality. It's very hard to find that in a, in a job interview in the first place. But oftentimes you'll have people in authority. I have, I have not been alive for an election in the U.S. where I, have, I, voted, where I actually wanted to vote for a person. I find, I, I find that I'm voting for, okay... Who's the lesser of these two evils, right? That's typically how I voted. I've only, I'm 43, so I've only been voting for 20-something years. But, so maybe others have fonder, better memories than I do. But I'm commonly voting for people that I look at and they're both bad. And I'm voting for who's the, who's the least bad. God's not that way. He finds people with character. If you want to be used by God, become a person of character by living in the Word, obeying the Word, getting around godly people. Allow your, your character to be transformed. Choose when you're tempted in the test. Um, to pray, get a bad grade instead of cheating. Because when you do that, you may, get a, you may get a bad grade in the classroom, but you get an A with God. And that will be, that will that'll affect how much God can use you. He finds people with character. When you're reading through the book of Genesis and you see Enoch walk with the Lord. So he was no more. God took him to heaven. You find Noah, like his great-grandfather, walked with the Lord. And what did God do? He saved people. He was a prophet who spoke to people. He used Noah. Why? Noah, why? Because he was someone who walked with God. You want to be used? Become a person of character. Yes, develop your skills and things like that. But when, they, when he found the apostles, they didn't have the education. The, the, uh, the Pharisees marveled in Acts chapter 4 because they were unlearned. They wouldn't get hired. They hadn't been to seminary. They were unlearned, but they had walked with the Lord and God used them. He doesn't need, yeah, it's great. Get your credentials and things like that if you can. But God doesn't necessarily need that to use you in a great way. He looks for people with character. Now, I want to invite EPT up here. How should we respond to the importance of having godly leaders to restrain sin in society and restrain sin and corruption in society? Here's a couple things how we should respond. Because of the importance of having godly leadership to restrain sin and promote righteousness in society, this is the, what port you should write down, Believers must support their leaders through prayer and other practical ways. Believers should support their leaders through prayer and other practical ways. They should pray for their leaders to be saved, protected from evil, that they would be wise and righteous. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 says, God is pleased when you pray for your leaders and their salvation so we can live peaceful lives. They should also support them by encouraging them instead of criticizing them. Uh, when you're in leadership, people criticize. You should... Try to encourage them instead of criticizing them. You should obey them. You should lovingly hold them accountable when they need it, if they're living in sin or falling short in some way. And you should serve them in other practical ways. Hebrews 13, 7 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, 
for they keep watch over your souls and will give an account for their work. Let them do this with joy because you weren't being critical and you weren't being a pain. Let them do this with joy and not with complaints for this would be of no advantage to you. They're going to be held accountable for shepherding you, but you're also going to be accountable for how you respond to them even when they're not great leaders, right? And so we should pray for our leaders and support them in various ways. Here's the second thing. Because of the importance of having godly leadership to restrain sin and promote righteousness in society, believers should pray for God to raise up godly leaders like Joseph serving in leadership, like Daniel serving in leadership in an ungodly land. Um, We should pray for God to raise up these godly leaders. Um, Esther, who helped save the Jews. But we should also prayerfully consider serving in leadership. You should prayerfully consider serving in leadership. Again, God put Joseph, David, Daniel, Obadiah, Nehemiah in leadership positions. Both Joseph, Daniel, and Obadiah, if you don't remember who Obadiah was, in 1 Kings 18, he worked for Ahab, this ungodly king, and Jezebel who was killing prophets. He worked for him, but he was saving the prophets and stashing them in caves. All three of these, Joseph, Daniel, and Obadiah, worked in ungodly environments under ungodly leaders. But yet, God used them. They remain loyal to God in these environments. Proverbs 29.2 in the New Living Translation says this, When the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked are in power, they groan. They mourn because of the ungodly leadership. Again, Romans 13.1-7, through 7, God says, Those in authority are God's servants meant to reward the righteous and punish wrongdoers. Serving in leadership positions is difficult. I'll attest to that. But it's a tremendous way to honor God. And a tremendous way to be a blessing to people. Yeah, it's difficult. There's hardships that come with it. But you end up being a blessing to people. People rejoice when there are godly people in leadership. And guess what? When you see in Scripture and you find God calling for people, puts people in leadership, he often finds the reluctant leader. Look, Moses, not not, not me. (laughs) You got the wrong guy. I don't speak well. I don't speak well. Gideon, you great mighty warrior. No, no, no. I'm the least in my family. I'm the the least tribe in Israel, the least in my family. I'm the lowest in Israel. You've got the wrong guy. He often finds the reluctant leader. You find, you say to yourself, look, I can't lead. Look, if you develop righteous character, God may call you. He may call you even though you may lack some aspects of leadership because he's looking for someone that's righteous and he equips them. And sometimes he puts good leaders around you like God gave Moses Um, Aaron, his brother, who was a great speaker, he put good people around him so that he could lead and make moral decisions with someone else may not be able to make because of their selfish ambition. Because they want to be the ones that are in leader. Lead in leadership. He finds a reluctant leader, someone with character, and he says, I want to use you. So you should be willing to say, okay, I'll do it. (laughs) Okay, I'll serve in this leadership position. Because it's a tremendous way to influence communities um, in a righteous manner, when uh, there's ungodly people that, that sometimes would influence, influence it in a negative manner, we should continually pray for our leaders, support them, but also prayerfully consider serving in those leadership positions. Here we look at this, in this context, we, uh, in this text, we see the corruption in Israel based on the leadership that's given. Ahab, Jezebel, they frame a man named Naboth who's te- who seems to be a righteous man who fears the Lord. If you're going to guard against corruption in your life and in the spheres that God's placed you, you've got to be very careful about greed. Greed will make you compromise just so you can get promoted. It'll make you not say anything just so you can get into a higher leadership position. You've got to be very careful about greed. That will be a way that will lead you into corruption, greed and covetousness. If you're going to guard against corruption, you must be careful of ungodly relationships that will lower your conscience. Oh, that's, it's really not that bad because everybody else is doing it. They're all illegally downloading. They're all doing these things. It's okay because everybody else is doing it. You've got to be careful about ungodly relationships. Third thing is we, if you're going to guard against corruption, you've got to have righteous leaders. You've got to pray for them. You've got to support them. People in leadership help influence them when they're going the wrong way. But you also must be willing to allow God to say, you, I want you to step up. And maybe the door and the fact that others, others have encouraged you to step up in that position may be the fact that God is calling you to serve in leadership. Um, I want to take a second to pray in response. In your bulletin or in your, your, uh, your outline, there are a couple of things we can pray over. If you could pray for God to deliver us from greed. Philippians 2 says, do all things without selfish ambition, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. 
Pray that God would deliver us from selfish ambition. I think there is a, a kingdom ambition. I think there's a godly ambition, but selfish ambition cares only about ourselves. Pray that God would rip that out of us because it ultimately leads to destruction, greed, covetousness, discontentment. It hurts us. Pray that God would empower us to be content through Christ, whether in times of blessing or trial. Second thing, pray that God would help us cut any cords with the world that are negatively influencing us, friendships, entertainment, news sources that are influencing us in a wrong way, but yet that we would yoke ourselves to what is good and righteous. Pray for God to guide and protect and give supernatural wisdom to our leaders so they can lead in righteous manners at Handong, at our churches, in our homes, our fathers, our mothers, in the businesses, in the medical field, the church. And pray that God will raise up righteous leaders. Again, deliver us from greed, cut any cords with the world, supernatural wisdom for our leaders, and to rise up godly leaders. Take a second to respond in prayer. prayer. Let's go ahead and stand and honor God. Let's stand as we close in prayer. If you could take a second, um, if you could pray for the person or the people that are next to you on both sides to you or if there's somebody in front of you, if you could pray that God would set them free from every trap of the devil, every way the enemy tries to lead them into compromise, to, to dull their conscience, to go further and further away from God in dating relationships, further and further away from God in their integrity on the internet, further and further away from God in various different ways. If you could pray that God would make them righteous, that they would speak for God, that he would hide his word in their hearts, and God would use them to influence communities and people for righteousness in the education system, in the business world, in government, so be it. That God would use them mightily. Pray for those around you right now that God would bless them and use them and favor them for his kingdom. Father, we come before you and we offer up our church that you would deliver us from any leaven. You said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We pray to deliver us from compromise in personal lives that spreads and becomes corporate, that you would make our church a holy church that you can use, used to influence HIS and Handong, used to influence Pohang, but also use us to influence the world as we send our graduates out, send our professors out to serve in various places. Make us a holy church lump. Make Handong a holy lump. Father, we submit to you our leadership, especially as we're seeking a new president of the university. Would you bring us someone who fears you? Bring us someone who you've already shaped, who you've been getting rid of compromise throughout their life since they were a child. And there's someone that can influence this community in a righteous manner. We pray that even the election process would be done in a way that's pleasing to you and that's above reproach. We ask that you give the leadership of this nation our president, governors, and senators, Lord, we pray that each one of them would know you and be saved. Where there is corruption, we pray that there would be repentance. We pray that there would be exposure. We pray that this nation would please you and it be a holy nation that affects nations around the world. We thank you for hearing our prayers and we honor you this morning. We exalt you because you're a holy God and you've called us to be holy. And you've given us your Holy Spirit and you've given us Christ to make us like your son. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you, Father. Amen. We're over time. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. God bless you.